Let's now try an example with branch cuts. So suppose we want to calculate the following real valued integral, an integral from zero to infinity of the square root of x divided by x squared plus a squared dx, with a being a positive number. How can we use complex contour analysis to simplify the calculation of this real valued integral? So as always, there's two ingredients to solving this problem. The first thing is trying to figure out what a complex function f of z should be if we calculate the contour integral. Well, in this case, it's pretty straightforward. We're going to use z to the power of 1 half divided by z squared plus a squared. But then the next ingredient is figuring out what the contour should be. And in this particular case, we need to be wary of that complex square root which has conventionally a branch cut here along the negative real axis. So this part of the complex plane we should stay away from, obviously, because there the function is no longer holomorphic and all our theorems then would stop to, to work. Okay, taking this into account, um, obviously we should have the positive real axis because that's the integral that we're interested in. So our contour should contain this part. And then let's close this with the conventional semicircle. Um, but then obviously here for the negative real axis, we should make sure that we keep in the upper half plane. So we're going to take the limits of this thing approaching the, the branch cut, but from the top so that we never cross, uh, cross the branch cut. And then just to be on the safe side, we're also going to include a small little circle here so that we can exclude the branch point as well. So now we have the two main ingredients. We have our function f of z, we have our contour. So now everything is ready to start the machinery of residue calculus to evaluate that particular integral. So pause the video and try and see if you can calculate the value of this contour integral. Residue calculus tells us that this integral is equal to 2 pi j, then the sum of all the residues inside the contour. So what are our residues that we need to worry about here? If you look at the denominator, this thing vanishes for j a and minus j a. So in our case, we only need to worry about j a because uh, a is a positive number. And if we later on take the limits of this radius going towards plus infinity, we will always include this point JA over here. So that's the only thing we need to worry about. So you have the residue at JA. By the way, JA is of course a single pole because it's related to this denominator over here. So don't be confused and say that JA is a branch cut, a branch point, simply because we have already this, this square root over here. It's not because you have a square root in the numerator that then suddenly all other singularities in the denominator, which have nothing to do with the square root, also become branch points. So don't confuse branch points and uh, single poles here. Good, let's calculate the residue. So we have 2 pi j. And we're going to use the formula where we keep the numerator and take the derivative of the denominator and then, then fill out uh, the value that we're interested in. So that's j a in our case. So that's going to be 2 pi j. And then we have the square root of j a divided by 2 j a. Let's do some housekeeping over here, getting rid of the 2 and the j. So finally we have pi over a. And then we have the square root of j a. Let's focus on the square root of a first. So that's something we can just uh, write like that. And then we have the square root of j. Now j is exponential j pi over 2. And then if we take the square root of that, we basically need to half uh, the angle. So finally we can write that this is uh, pi divided by the square root of a exponential j pi over 4. An exponential j pi over 4, just to check that we're consistent with our choice of branch cut. So we basically, basically should have solutions which are not in this left half plane, but only in the right half plane. And exponential j uh, pi over 4 
is indeed in this correct half plane. So that's consistent with our choice of branch cut. Okay, that's the first part done. We've calculated the value of our integral through residue calculus and then ended up with this particular result over here. Now, the next step is trying to figure out what the different contributions to the contour are and then how we can tease them apart so that we only end up with the real valued integral that we're interested in. So the first thing we're going to look at is this big circle over here. So pause the video and think about the contribution from that big semicircle. For the big semicircle, we're obviously needing to look at the big limit theorem. So the big limit theorem tells us that this contribution vanishes um, if the following limit vanishes. So we're looking at the limit at infinity of our function, which is z to the power of one half z squared plus a squared. And then very important, do not forget the following factor, z minus the uh, center of our circle. So z minus zero in that case. So if we evaluate this limit, it's obvious to see that because the power in the denominator of z is bigger than the one in the numerator, this thing will be pulled to zero regardless of direction of approach. If you want this to be a little bit more explicit, you can write that this is basically the modulus of z to the power of 3, 2 times exponential j, 3, 2, the argument of z, and then divide it by uh, the same thing here with power of 2, exponential j, 2, arc, z, plus a squared. And then again, the same argument, since these complex exponentials here are always bounded, regardless of the value of arc z, if you take the limits of modulus z going towards infinity, this thing will always end up at zero. So that means that we don't need to worry about the contribution from the big semicircle. It will vanish. Okay, that's good news. Next step is trying to figure out what will happen to the contribution of that little semicircle, which we've introduced to try and stay clear of the branch point. So pause the video and think about the value of that particular semicircle. Right, we need to do something similar, but in this case, we need to look at the small limit theorem and taking the limits of z going towards zero of the same thing, z to the power of one half, z squared plus a squared, not forgetting z minus zero. And then very obviously this becomes zero divided by a squared is zero. So also this contribution vanishes, which means that we do not have to worry about the contribution from the branch point. So that's good news. We've gotten rid of all the, the circles. So the, the only contributions we still have is the one here on the negative real axis, or rather just above the negative real axis, and then this part over here. So for our final step, pause the video and take stock of what we have, and then see if you can use the things we've calculated so far to calculate this particular real valued integral because that was our goal all along obviously right let's see what we have um, so our integral only has two more contributions at this point in time we have the negative real axis so the integral from minus infinity to zero of z one half z squared plus a squared dz and then we have a second contribution from zero to infinity also z one half z squared plus a squared dz and we've calculated that uh, this was equal to a certain number which we'll come back to uh, to later but what we also need to do in this stage is going from z to x. So if we have z to the power of one half, what does that translate to if we uh, go on either the negative real axis or the positive real axis? Now for the positive real axis, that just becomes the square root of x. So if x is a positive number, um, but if x is a negative number, it becomes 
something different, it becomes j square root of minus x if x is a negative number. If at least we are uh, consistent with the conventional choice of branch cut, which is what we want to do in this case. So if you're not convinced about this particular result here, just look back at the original description of when we introduced branch cuts, because then we also calculated the value of the square root of a number just above the negative real axis. So either look back at that video or just a brief recap of the argument. So if we have a complex number, which is, which is just above the negative real axis, then this can be written as exponential j uh, pi minus a small number epsilon, at least in terms of angles. Let's not worry about the magnitude here. And if we then take the naive square root, just seeing if we can divide the angles by two, that gives us exponential j pi over two minus epsilon over two as a candidate result. Is that, of course, something which is consistent with our choice of branch cut? Well, for our choice, choice of branch cut, we need something in the right half plane. And you see what we have over here is exponential j pi over 2. So that's the positive imaginary axis, but slightly smaller in terms of angle. This is indeed a point which is lying in the correct half plane. And then if we take the limits of epsilon going towards zero, we do indeed end up at j here, so which is this particular j, and then a positive number. Remember, of course, that x is negative, so this whole thing will give us a positive imaginary, purely imaginary number. Okay, that was just to go from z to x. Now that we have that, we can write that our integral is equal to the integral from minus infinity to zero of j square root of minus x, and then we have x squared plus a squared dx, and then 0 infinity square root of x, x squared plus a squared dx. At this point you might be slightly worried that we have this j popping up here because we are interested in a real valued integral, and at the moment this is not real valued, but don't worry, everything will work out fine in the end, as you will see. Because what we're going to do now is see if we can find a relationship between this integral and that integral. Obviously, what we want to do in order to realize that is replace x by minus x in our first integral. So, yeah, let's see what happens. So, here we have a minus sign then, so this becomes very much like this factor. Um, in the denominator, because x squared is even, also nothing changes. So what changes is the signs in the uh, limits here. We also have a minus sign from the x, but that minus sign we will use to flip the, the order, so that we also go from 0 to infinity. At the end of the day, the only difference is that there's a factor j in front of this first term. So we have actually j times that integral plus 1 times that integral. It is the same integral in both cases, apart from the prefactor. The integral of square root of x, x squared plus a squared dx. Good. Let's now recap the results of residue calculus. Residue calculus has told us that the value of that integral is pi divided by the square root of a exponential j pi over 4. And exponential j pi over 4 we know that that is equal to 1 plus j divided by the square root of 2. And that's good news because now 1 plus j here, 1 plus j there, that cancels. So the final result, if we bring everything together, is that the integral from 0 to infinity, square root of x, x squared plus a squared dx, is equal to pi divided by the square root of 2a. So thanks to residue calculus, we can solve this thing uh, relatively painlessly. Let's hope you found it uh, painless as well.